On September 22nd, 1862, Abraham President Lincoln issued a proclamation. It read, on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state shall be then thenceforth and forever free. It would take many months before all slaves in our country were freed, but after the months of fighting, the Confederacy of surrendering, our president being assassinated, in a difficult political process, the 13th Amendment was ratified and a slavery was officially abolished. On December 18, 1865, the news swept across Capitol Hill, down the Shenandoah, over the Appalachian Mountains, along the Carolinas, into the plantations of Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, and into the cotton fields of Texas and Arkansas. Slaves are free. Slaves were celebrating. They were so excited. They were jumping up and down. But within a few hours, that celebration had turned to gloom as they returned to their barracks and it dawned on them, where am I going to live? How am I going to get a job? How will we raise our kids? Where will they go to school? How do we handle health care? All these things and Many of them, before the day was over, took the long walk to the big house to talk to their masters about their future. And by the next morning, most of them had returned to the fields as sharecroppers. They were freed as slaves, but the practical implications were difficult to figure out. Likewise, Christians who have committed their lives to Christ have been set free from death and from sin. But the practical process of living that out and experiencing victory over sin proves to be very difficult. Many Christians, although they've been set free from the power of sin by union with their uh, with Christ's death and resurrection, still live in slavery to sin. In Romans 6, the Apostle Paul deals with the question of what practical difference does justification by grace through faith make in a person's life? Many believers are surprised to find that they give their lives to Christ and they still are struggling with sin. Things that were tempting to them before they came to faith in Christ are still alluring. Maybe you're not a believer. You say, my experience is, I see Christians and I don't see them as being all that different from non-Christians. Can a Christian gain victory over sin? Teenager? Young single? Married person? Senior citizen? You need to have an answer to that question. Here's Paul's answer in Romans 6. To win the battle with sin, we must know certain things. We must know certain things, and then based on that knowledge, we do certain things. So open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. If you'd like to use the Bibles under our seats, it's on page 1,131. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? This is a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a statement in the form of a query. It doesn't expect an answer. Paul does this throughout the book of Romans. In doing so, he sets his critics on their heels. They don't know how to answer his questions. He asks another rhetorical question in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Now back to verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He raises a question, then he answers it in verse 2. By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Paul tells us we can have victory over sin. We're taught corrective of theology. When we sin, we know that we can come to Christ for forgiveness and be forgiven. But we need 
preventive theology. How do we prevent sin? Uh, preventive medicine is a big deal today. It's not enough just to know where the hospitals are in Portland so you know where you can go if you get sick. You need to know how to prevent sickness, how to stay well. Christians need to be taught in preventive discipleship. Our 17-year-old daughter, Erica, talks to me all the time about learning to drive. Problem for her is she has cerebral palsy and her hands don't work so well. So pray for me. It could be scary. Now, there's a couple ways I can teach her to drive. One is I could get on uh, her Google Maps and point out where all the hospitals are in Portland. I could put a little medicine kit in her car and if she gets in an accident, she can, uh, you know, tend, tend to herself. I could show her on the insurance card uh, the phone number she calls if she gets in an accident. Or I could actually teach her how to drive safely. Truth is, I think her best shot is with the advance of self-driving cars. That's her ticket to the future. Many Christians need instructions in how to avoid sin. In Romans 6, Paul tells us four things we should know about our salvation which can help us gain victory over sin. These are so important. First, know who you are. Verse 3, or don't you know... This is the first of several times Paul asks that question. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is some of the best teaching in all the Bible on baptism. Several of you have been baptized this past year. We do it right up here. And uh, what does it mean when we're baptized? Paul says, don't you know that when you become a Christian and are baptized, you're baptized into Christ's death and resurrection? So you are buried with him in baptism. And then you're raised to a new life through his resurrection. It, through our union with Christ, we essentially are dead to sin, he says but we're alive to Christ through the resurrection. We need to view ourselves this way. Parents, talk to your children about that if they give their lives to Christ, they, they are dead to sin and they're raised to a new life. A classic example of how, how we view ourselves makes a huge difference on how we live uh, occurred through a mistake in a computer uh, program in England. At the beginning of the school year, uh, one teacher was given a class of students and told, these students are very bright. But it was a computer glitch, and so they were really low-achieving students. Another teacher was said, your students are very low-achieving. But it was a mistake. They were very bright. Five and a half months later, the administration realized they'd made them, it was a, uh, an error. But they thought before they actually uh, remedied the problem, they would test the students. And it was very interesting. The bright students, their scores had dropped significantly. But the low-achieving students, their test scores had risen significantly. How come? It all had to do with the way the teachers viewed their students. They asked the teachers that had uh, bright students, supposedly bright, but they were really low-achieving, how did you deal with this? And they said, well, we knew they were bright, but it wasn't working. They weren't getting it. So we figured it was our method. So we changed our teaching style. And those students, um, you know, uh, they, their test scores really rose because the teachers viewed them as bright. And they, we, they came to them with hope and optimism and confidence. You guys can get this. The way we view ourselves as followers of Christ makes all the difference on how we live. If you see a butterfly, you don't say, oh, look at this converted worm. <laughs> I mean, nobody talks that way. It, why? Because it was a worm. It's not anymore. It's a butterfly. Now, as a butterfly, you may not always remember that you're a butterfly. You may land on things you shouldn't. You may play with some of your old worm friends. 
But you're never going to go back to being a, a worm. You're a butterfly. If you're a Christian, your old life has died with Christ when he died on the cross. And you're raised to a new life through his resurrection. You're never going to be that old person again. Second, know that your old self was crucified with Christ so that your body of sin might be rendered powerless. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. What does it mean to say that our old self was crucified with Christ on the cross so it was rendered powerless? How and in what sense have we died to sin? Now, this cannot mean that sin has no appeal for us. This summer, uh, Jory and I and Tad went to Leadership Summit, Global Leadership Summit uh, in Chicago, and one of the speakers was Danielle Strickland, and she reported one in six internet searches are for porn. One in five phone inquiries are for porn. 60% of men admit to viewing porn once a week. Although numerous studies have shown that porn is uh, damaging to our minds and our relationships, 96% of 18 to 24-year-olds do not think porn is negative. Nora Volkow uh, studies addictions, alcohol, uh, drugs, tobacco, caffeine, gambling, eating disorders, shopping, compulsive sexual behaviors, and pornography. Adding them all together, 472 million Americans have addictions. That's 1.6 addictions per person. I mean, we're messed up. This alone should convince us that the sin nature is alive and well. The rest of the Bible teaches that our old nature is still alive and active in regenerate believers. Otherwise, it would make no sense for Paul to say, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. Why command a body that's dead to sin not to sin? So what does it mean to be dead to sin? The phrase died to sin is used three times in Romans 6. Twice it refers to Christians in verses 2 and 11. Once it refers to Christ in verse 10. A fundamental principle of biblical interpretation is that if a phrase occurs three times in the same passage, it means the same thing. So we must find an explanation of dead to sin that's true both of Christ and of believers. We cannot take Christ died to sin in verse 10 to mean that he became unresponsive to it. That would indicate that before he was responsive to it. He never was responsive to sin, so he didn't need to die to it. So what's the meaning of dead to sin? Which Christ died and we died to in beginning a relationship with him. Whenever sin and death are mentioned together in the Bible, the essential relationship between them is that death is sin's penalty. Christ died for sins and died for sin's penalty. We have died to sin in the sense that in Christ we have borne its penalty. We deserve to die by our sin, by union with Christ. We did die, not in our own person, but in Him as our substitute. And by union with Christ, we have been raised to be a justified sinner, a life that is altogether new. The old life is finished. We have died to it. How can this crucifixion with Christ lead to overcoming the old nature? The answer is in verse 7. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. There's a third thing you must know. Know that since you have been united with Christ's death and resurrection, you can consider yourself dead to sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Verse 9, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Once we realize that our old life has ended, we shall want to have nothing more to do with it. We're now living a new life. Why would we want to go back to the old life? 
Can, can a married woman live as if she's still single? Well, I suppose she could. But, feel, but if she feels that ring on her finger, she realizes she's married and she should live accordingly. Can Christians live as if they are still in slavery to sin? Well, I suppose we can. But why would we want to do that? We remember who we are and then we live accordingly. So the secret is in knowing who we are. It's knowing that our old self was crucified with Christ when he died on the cross and live accordingly. Our old life was put to death in Christ. Why would we want to turn to that old way of living? You died to those sins. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Think about who you are and then be who you are. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Verse 12, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. Wise Christians know that things can go wrong. There are people who, if they, we let them, will take our jobs, our money, and even our mates. Author Sinclair Lewis received a letter from a young woman, pretty young woman. She said, I'd like to be your secretary. I can type, I can file, I'll do anything else you want. And when I see anything, say anything, I mean anything. Well, Sinclair handed it over to his wife, Dorothy. And she responded, she says, Mr. Lewis already has a secretary who can type and file. And I take care of everything else. <laughs> and when I say everything, I mean everything. That's cutting a problem off, nipping it in the bud. You consider yourself dead to sin. There's a fourth and final truth you must know. Know that you are a slave to whomever or whatever you obey. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul speaks to people who are saying, hey, Christ died for all sins, so we can sin as much as we want. We can just be forgiven. In the first century, slaves were the absolute possession of their masters. They could not be slaves to two different masters. Likewise, Paul says you can only serve one master. You either serve Christ or you serve sin. But thanks be to God, verse 17, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Because we, are, we know that we're a slave to someone, Paul tells us to offer ourselves as slaves to God. Verse 13, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Since we're slaves to something, we must discipline ourselves to become slaves to Christ. Rasmus Ankerson was also a speaker at this summer's leadership summit. He's an expert on development. He's worked with athletes all around the world. He's the chairman of the football club, soccer club, Midland Soccer in Denmark, and Brentford, a soccer club in England. He studied Olympic athletes all around the world, and what he likes to do is travel to their home country and find out something about them, their seeds of greatness. So he was very interested in traveling to, to see the MVP track and field club in Kingston, Jamaica. They've had so many Olympic stars, gold medalists, and of course their most famous right now is Usain Bolt. He's the world record holder in the 200 meters, 19.19 .19 seconds. That is fast. And in the 100 meters, 9.58 seconds. Uh, the MVP track and field club is coached by Steve Francis, who got his master's at the University of Michigan in statistics. So Ankerson landed there, and 
When he arrived at the club, he expected to find, you know, many tracks and huge scoreboards and, uh, you know, massive weight room and the finest facilities, massage tables and, you know, ice uh, uh, baths and saunas and jacuzzis and, you know, uh, food facilities. Instead, it was so spare, he thought he maybe had come to the wrong place. And then he saw Francis sitting on the side of the track with a stopwatch. And he came and he sat down beside him and he said, how come this place is so Spartan? And Francis answered, a performance center should not be designed for comfort, but for improvement. I mean, athletes, when they're recruited, you know, they look at the facilities and often that's a closing deal. You know, who wants to come to this place and this school, this club? And uh, Francis says, no, we don't design this one for comfort. It's for improvement. If we want to be slaves to Christ, we should not design our lives for comfort, but for improvement. We want to discipline ourselves. Jay Leno said, I'll do anything for a great body except diet and exercise. <laughs> 14, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Paul says, Christ's death sets us free from sin and makes us alive to Christ. Nine weeks ago, I had surgery on my broken wrist for a water skiing accident. Last Sunday, I asked Matt, he's got a boot on his ankle. I said, what happened, Matt? And he said, I had a water skiing accident. <laughs> so that's the new, new rule around here. If you get hurt, that's how it happened. And um, so they put a, a plate in and they said, my bone's all healed now. That's not going to change. But now I'm doing occupational therapy to get the ligaments that were probably sprained when I fell off a ladder. And... Uh, the tendons that shrunk when I had it in the cast for six weeks to get it working again. So my right hand is my the gold standard and the left one I have to get to that same place. So it's not quite there. And then this one can do about a 90 degree angle and I got a ways to go on this one, okay? So I have to discipline my body, make it a slave to my commands. We have a mandate to share the good news with people that they can experience a right relationship with God through grace, through faith. But that's only half our task. We also call people to discipleship and holy living. We don't do this by focusing on not sinning, but on focusing on becoming a slave to Christ. We keep our focus on Him. We offer the parts of our body, our eyes, our mind, our hands, our feet in service to Christ. To win the battle with sin, we must know certain things. We become what we think. The way you think about yourself makes a huge difference in whether or not you can live a holy life. You ask yourself, don't you know who you are? Don't you know that you've been united with Christ through his death? Don't you know that your old life was crucified with Christ? Don't you know that since you're united with Christ in his death and resurrection, you can consider yourself dead to sin? How could you think to become a slave to sin again? And then you answer, yes, I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I've been raised with Christ to a new life. And by the grace of God, I'll live accordingly. Just as American slaves were set free from their human masters, you and I have been set free from sin. To win the battle with sin, we must know certain things and live accordingly. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that the gospel is not just a gospel of forgiveness and grace, but it's also a gospel of power. You give us your Holy Spirit to live inside of us who gives us all the power we need to gain victory over sin. And we want to experience that right now. I want to give you a moment to, to, to pray. You just pray silently where you're seated. <laughs>
If you've never given your life to Christ, you say, Christ, I want you in my life. I believe you're the Son of God. You died for me. Would you come in and forgive my sin? Maybe you say, I've already done that, but you say, I want to experience this power. I don't want to live in slavery to sin any longer. Well, tell Christ that, that you want that. You want the power of his Holy Spirit, and you want to remember who you are this week and consider yourselves dead to sin. You pray, everyone. Lord God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you loved us so much. You created us. You created this world. And you sent your son to show us who you are and to die for our sins. And Father, thank you that you give us power. You give us your Holy Spirit to live inside of us. More than a match for our sin nature. Oh, we're tempted, but we don't have to fall every time as we turn to you and depend on you. Help us to do that this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.